Hardy and Weinberg realized. Yeah, they're two different people. Is that their first I think it's their last name. All right, they were mathematicians, and they they came up with this these equations as ways of studying populations, and and really you can you can use them to check and see if populations are evolving. If the allele frequencies for the gene pool change over time, for instance, you might measure them as 0.3 for the dominant, 0.7 for the recessive allele now, but if you come back in 100 years and it's changed to 0.4 and 0.6, that means the population is evolving. It's a way to measure evolution. Y'all remember this from last time? If the numbers stay the same generation after generation, we say that the population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is when the numbers do not change generation after generation. That means the population is not evolving. Now this is kind of a theoretical thing. It doesn't really happen in real populations. All populations are always evolving some. And there's reasons for that. And these guys outline the reasons that all populations are always evolving. Here they are. The first thing that can happen in a population is kittens. Yay. Kittens throw everything off. See how all the kids, all these kids are the same litter, but they're different, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Why aren't they all the same? Genetic variation. <laughs> um, you can have very populations have variations, and they're due to a lot of different things. But one thing Hardy Weinberg realized is there can be mutation. These are uh, violations, violations to Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. <coughs> Mutation is a violation. If Several of the alleles mutate and go from dominant to recessive. Well, then that'll change your numbers, wouldn't it? I don't know if you know, but a dominant gene is usually a, a, a gene that's that's codes correctly for the protein. A recessive gene is a gene that has some mutation that causes the protein not to be made correctly. Do y'all remember that? That's that's what really dominant and recessive mean. Remember, remember uh, the recessive um, traits for Mendel's pea plants. What were the Mendel's pea plants like if they had two recessive genes? Short. They were short. They weren't able to grow right. They were like dwarfs, and that would that's bad. You got to have two recessive genes. Neither of them allow you to grow correctly. So that's why they ended up short. And that usually would kill. The plants. Because they wouldn't grow tall enough, they wouldn't get enough light. But not always. Maybe it some weird kind of way could could save them. Maybe the tall ones get eaten by horses. And only the short ones would survive. I don't know. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Alright. Yeah. So mutation is a cause of Hardy Weinberg uh, is is a violation of Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. Another one is called genetic drift. Genetic drift is due to, uh, is changes in your allele frequencies due to random events. This is an example of what's called a bottlenecking event. Here we have an original population 
with a whole bunch of different colored marbles representing the population. And there's some sort of bottlenecking event. Often this happens in nature like a lot of organisms suddenly die. Remember when the meteorite hit the earth and killed the dinosaurs? Um, a big fire could run through Yellowstone Park, for instance. Kill a whole lot of organisms. What if like just like the plants died around them or stuff? Yeah, maybe from disease. And then they don't have enough food, and a lot of the plants die, and animals die. Things happen like that all the time. So, only a few survive. The new population will be different from the old population just by random chance. The ones that survive is often random. So here it looks like you've got a lot more of these tan ones that survive than the green ones just by chance. And now if you let these mate with one another and they reform a new large population, you might have green a, a lot less than, than tan in the new population. That's an example of what we call genetic drift. It doesn't have to be a bottlenecking event. It could just be random chance. It could just be randomly, let's say green is recessive could just be random chance that greens happen to mate more one year than, than tans. Just by chance, and the greens were able to, to mate more. That'll drive the recessive numbers up if green is recessive. Maybe next year the tan ones mate more, and the green, the recessives will get, then go down. And these kind of, these numbers, will never stay exactly the same. They'll kind of move up and down just with the random process of mating. Another one is called gene flow. Also known as migration. Let's say green is recessive and brown is dominant. Here's a population of all recessives. Here's a population of all dominants. So what if this population is minding its own business, it's got all recessives, no dominance. What if a dominant gene individual from this population migrated into this population? Wouldn't that change the numbers for, for the recessive population? Mm -hmm. They'd have more dominance. So the Q would go down, the P would go up because of the migration. So we, we call that gene flow, genes flowing from one population to another. You have to stop that. You have to have no gene flow if you're going to stay in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Unless by some odd chance, genes that come in exactly reflect the allele frequencies in your gene pool. But the chance of that is very rare. Look at these mutations. Um, we you often get questions in AP Biology about fruit flies. You know what the species name of fruit fly is? What the genus name, I'm sorry? Anyone? No one knows? Caucus. Took my tongue. Drosophila is what we call them. Melanogaster is is a certain type that has dark pigment on its butt. But Drosophila, fruit flies. Can you say Drosophila? Drosophila. You should know that because they'll, they'll, they'll introduce, they'll talk about Drosophila. Drosophila fruit flies are easy to work with in genetic experiments. You can, uh, you can find these things. You can, you can grow them in little plastic tubes and if you put food in there they'll live and they'll reproduce and you can you can control them very easily. 
So a lot of a lot of experiments with fruit flies have been done. Do you remember the fruit flies and the genetics problems that we did? There were a lot of a lot of those. So you can see there's all sorts of mutations. Wild type means the normal type that you find in the wild, the, the predominant type. That's what wild type means. Doesn't mean they're wild like they're crazy flies. Mm -hmm. Um, but look, bar eyes, that's a mutation. How the eyes are real thin. Kind of bar shaped. Cut wings. Look at the back of the wings is different. Rudimentary wings are real small. They're not real small, but they're smaller than the wild type. Rotated abdomen. Look, it's like a curved butt. There's the vestigial wings. That's a recessive trait. Those can't fly at all. Curly wings. Look at the curly wings. Aren't those cool? Mm -hmm. You like to have curly wings? It is very impressive. Bithorax. It means there's two. The uh, mid middle of the body has separate set of wings. See that? Mm-hmm. Then dikeet. I guess they're just spread out more. The wings are just spread out more. Anyway, there's all sorts of mutations that can uh, affect populations. So that's a way to affect hardy weinberg equilibrium. There's non random mating. Maintain Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. The mating has to be random. You have to randomly select from the population. So, uh, I mean, you have to randomly mate with one another. So, in other words, you can't. You, if you if you prefer the dominant individual, if you prefer to mate, let's say these are rabbits, and the recessive, the, the dominant is the brown, big B brown, and the recessive is little b white. If, if the rabbits prefer brown over white and tend to mate with just the brown ones, then the brown will go up and the white will go down. So you can't have a preference for who you're mating with if, if you're going to maintain Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And so we see, uh, we don't see that in real populations. There's often a preference. Like um, the lion with the biggest uh, mane, that's who the females like to mate with. That is called a frigate bird. You find those on the Galapagos. They're all over the place, but I saw a bunch of them there. The one with the biggest pouch is the one that gets to make this red throat pouch that they blow up. Um, that looks like, what, is that a turkey? A pheasant. The ones with the prettiest colors. And then the deer, or what is that, a caribou? What is that? Thomas, are you a hunter? What do we got there? No, um, so the ones with the biggest racks, that's what the females go for. They like they like these. And these <laughs> these uh, ones with, with the big racks, they will uh, compete with the other males and and for the females and often win the competition. Um, so these are all examples of where the mating is not random. It just, especially in animals, it's just, it's not random who you mate with. Um, so, environmental variance, that has to do with selection. I think this is a different section. 
Are we in the next section? Let me talk about selection. Now, when we say selection, we're usually talking about natural selection. This was Darwin's theory. Darwin's theory of natural selection is the idea that nature selects the ones that survive. And uh, some, some sets of alleles are more beneficial for survival than others. So let's say that the white coat for the rabbit helps it survive. Maybe it lives in a snowy area where it snows all the time. Maybe it's in like northern Canada. And it's the snow always all over the ground. So the brown ones are going to die and the white ones are going to survive. This is selection. Do you think that would change your numbers if the white ones survive more often than the brown ones? This Q would go up, P would go down. And so selection can change the, uh, can violate party one or equilibrium. So if you get any of these happen in a population, you're going to violate Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, the numbers are going to change, and evolution will occur. If any of those happen, evolution will occur. So, what are the odds that any of these happen in a population? 100%, basically. All populations are always evolving in nature, because we're always having some violations. What do you think about that? Nifty. Alright, questions about this? You're going to have to know all five of those things. And know what, know what they mean. Um, Environmental variance, is this in this section or is this in the next? This is in this section. So, the environment can also affect your appearance as well as your genes. And I'm not exactly sure why it's talking about this here in the book, but um, you know, you have genes that tell you what your skin color is, right? Mm -hmm. There's about four sets of genes, maybe five sets of genes that, that tell you what your skin color is. If you have dominant alleles for all five sets, you have really dark skin color. If you have recessive alleles for all five sets, you have really light skin color. But most people have kind of a mix. It's not completely light, it's not completely dark. And so you have this, this mix. However, it's not just your genes that tell you your skin color. It's also whether you've laid out in the sun. If you lay out in the sun, that can affect your skin color a bit. So your, your genes are influenced by the environment. And you can, it can change your, your appearance. So this, these uh, alligators, reptiles, are known for, if the eggs are incubated at cold temperatures, females are produced. If the eggs are incubated at warm temperatures, males are produced. And what will happen with reptiles, like sea turtles, they'll lay a whole bunch of eggs in the sand. And each organism, even though they're cold-blooded, each organism is doing metabolism and producing heat. So here we've got a bunch of eggs. Think about a, a whole bunch of eggs laid in the sand in a big, kind of, the, the, the female turtle will dig a hole, right? And we'll lay a bunch of eggs in there. Here's the hole she digs. And then she'll cover that up with dirt. So are all of these going to be male or female? I mean, all of them will be male or female, but which ones are going to be male, which ones are going to be female? Usually the ones on the inside, these that are surrounded have other eggs on all sides. Most of the heat stays in the middle. And so these will be hotter, so would they be male or female? They're hotter. Male. What? Male. See the, oh, I, I, I turned from the slide. 
There we go. So uh, eggs incubated at 33 produced males. So the males are going to be the hotter ones. So the ones in the middle will have to be males. And the ones on the outside that are touching the cooler sand will be uh, will be females. So is it opposite for turtles, or am I wrong? Like, I thought the turtles in cooler sand produce the male. Uh, that very well could be. It could be opposite for turtles. That'd be interesting. I, I don't know if alligators are. That, that would be interesting if they're different. They might be. So, what would be the effect if. Um, uh, the sand, if, if, if the sand got warmer because of global warming, if the whole environment got warmer, you'd have a lot more males than females, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. That's what's happening. And if you get more males than females, you don't get as many kids, because only the females have kids. They're seeing that. They're actually seeing that. So anyway, um, we're out of time. I need to... Uh, I need to give get my new wipers. Two white last ones.